Yeah. I'll be reading from John 14, 19 through 24. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Good morning. We've been studying God's love, and we undertook this study for a quarter, and at the beginning, I confess to thinking, how am I going to fill a quarter with one subject? And now I wish I had another quarter to keep going on the same subject, because I, I don't feel like I have done much more than scratch the surface or really begin to delve into the the depths that we could get into with uh, exploring the subject of God's love. And so that does a couple of things for me. I hope that it spurs me on to, and the rest of us as well, spurs us on to uh, further contemplation, further study about the subject specifically of God's love. And the other thing it does for me is it gives me uh, some excitement, some joy about the subjects that we have coming up, because I kind of thought the same thing about those as well as, as I was planning a, a full quarter of study on each of the, the things that we'll do this year and, and thinking, how will I fill a quarter with each of those things? Now I, I know that it can be done, um, and hopefully as we get into our quarters beginning next Sunday with the topic of how... We return that love to God, so we've studied for a quarter on God's love for us, and now we're going to look for a quarter at our love for God. And um, I am certain that there is uh, plenty of material within the Scriptures for us to be able to spend a quarter uh, really exploring the depths of that topic as well. So as we wrap up today on the topic of God's love for us, um, the thing that kept kind of playing over in my mind uh, was the idea of being near to God's heart. And, and that just, of course, I, I don't know if it was the, the song that, that uh, got me into that thinking or the, the thinking that got me to that song. I'm not sure which one of those happened first, but it, it got me to thinking about the old, the old hymn, Near to the Heart of God, that we'll look at in a moment. But uh, as I began thinking about that hymn, I, I thought of, you know, that really is a, a common theme through many of the old hymns, especially that we see uh, in our songbooks. Uh, many of these probably, as you uh, look at those in the, the outline, you would not only um, recognize the titles, but I can't even look at the titles without hearing the tune in my, in my mind. And, and uh, some of those just take me back to some of my earliest memories in the church of sitting on a pew next to my parents and, and uh, participating in the song service or hearing those songs being sung. And uh, they stick with me even to this day. And songs like Draw Me Nearer, and I think one of the most beautiful hymns that we sing, one of my all-time favorites, Nearer, Still Nearer. Uh, that's a song that just, um, that, that really is meaningful to me and, and one of my favorites. Uh, songs like Precious Lord, Take My Hand, or nearer my God to thee what about Jesus keep me near the cross or the song I need thee every hour and maybe a song that's a little less uh, familiar to the adults in the room but one that is in the teen song book I want to be where you are um, and so the songs like that that just sort of highlight the fact that we seek uh, and desire a closeness to God but it's really 
only reciprocating the, the desire that he has to be close to us. And we talked about that some last week with looking at some of those Psalms that, that in which God promises us that he will be near to us, that he will be there and very present in our lives. And so we have a God that wants to be close to us and he wants that so much that he devised a plan, that he developed a plan to ensure that we could be close to him. And so we have this desire that is instilled within us by God because it's a desire that matches the desire that he has. And so thankfully we have a God who wants to be close to us. We want to be close to him, and he wants to be close to us. The hymn that um, sort of got me thinking in this direction or, or thinking in this direction got me to this hymn. Like I said, I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, the first verse of that hymn, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin does not molest near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee, near to the heart of God. And what meaningful word those, words those are for us as we contemplate what this life offers and what this life supplies for us versus the promises of nearness that God makes to those who will seek him and the desire that he has to be near to us. We want that closeness with God. And the reason we want that closeness, I think, is the very thing that has been revealed to us through this study of God's love over this last quarter. We want to be close to him because he loves us. And why would we not want to be close to a God who loves us so much? So as we contemplate that love that he has for us, that love should draw us into his presence it should beckon us forth out of our lives of sin and draw us into his presence so with that thought sort of as our anchoring point this morning or as our background for what we'll look at i want us to recognize just as kind of a, a summary of where we've been and what we've talked about over this last quarter Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, and this is where we started because it's our theme verse for the year. It contains our theme verse for the year. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. And we will look at verses 7 through 21. We'll read through that, and then we'll pause, as you can imagine, pause for some comments. Beginning in verse 7, Beloved... Let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because he, as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment 
and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. And so we want to recognize the fact that there is one source of love, and, and that is central to what we've been talking about over this last quarter. And as we continue through uh, delving into other aspects of love, we have to recognize this one thing. If, if love doesn't originate from God, then what are we doing talking about it here? If love doesn't originate from God, then that means God is not the expert at love, that, that there might be someone or something out there that has a better understanding of love or that can teach us more about love than God can teach us. God must be the source of love if what we do here, if, if the faith that we have, if the lives that we live, if the, uh, if the dedication that we have to the to Christ and, and to his teaching, if that is to mean anything, then love has to originate from God. Because all of this, uh, everything that we do, the reason that we're here, it's all founded upon that, that, that foundation. It's all built upon that foundation. And if we don't recognize that, if we don't understand that it originates from God, then everything will crumble because that foundation won't hold up the structure of what it is that we want to do here, that what we want to accomplish uh, in, our, uh, in our spiritual lives. So love is from God, and we have to recognize that. Verse 7, going back to the beginning of the reading, uh, you know it says, for love is from God. The only way that we know what love is, the only reason that we know that there is love, is because God has demonstrated it to us God has shown us love. So we have to recognize God as the source of all love. In fact, we need to recognize a step further than that and, and realize that God not only is the source of love, but God is love. Verse 8, and also uh, later on in verse 16. God is love. His association with love is, is so intertwined, so intermixed, that if he were to cease loving, he would cease being God. If God were to be able to, to turn off that aspect of his character, he would no longer be who we understand him to be. God is love. And God's love, not only, not only is God love, but God's love is manifested in us, and, and that word manifested, I think we talked about it once earlier in the year uh, as, we were, uh, as we were looking at this section of 1 John chapter 4, but that word manifested means readily per perceived by the eye or the understanding. It means evident, obvious, apparent, plain. It means to put beyond doubt or question. God's love is manifested in us. Try to wrap your minds around the idea of a God who is love. You cannot separate the two things. You can't separate love and God. God is love, and yet his love is made evident, is made plain, is brought into understanding in the way that he deals with us. You see, there was no way for God to convince us that he is love without interacting with us. God couldn't put us on this earth and then step back and say, you people that I just created down there, I want to show you something and try to show us his love by doing something in another dimension or in another space. God had to show us his love through his interaction with us. When God created us, he committed to loving us, to demonstrate to us the love that he is, the love that he possesses. God could only demonstrate that through a relationship with us. Next, we see 
through this section in verses 12 and again in verse 16 that if we love one another, God abides in us. There's that idea of being near to the heart of God. God didn't create us to hold us at arm's length. God didn't create us to put us at a distance and say, you know what, y'all are kind of messy, stay over there, I really don't want you to touch me. God created us in order to be near us. And he taught us how to be near him by manifesting his love in us. Because he has taught us how to love, he has taught us how to be near him. And we can't be near him without understanding the love that he has shown to us. It says there that he has perfected his love in us. Now, wait a minute. God is love, right? Is God deficient in any way? Is God lacking anything? Of course not. And yet John tells us that God's love is perfected in us. Well, what does that word mean? It means made complete, brought to full term. It's brought to to full fruition through his relationship with us. You see, God is love. God is love so deeply, so, so uniquely that he created us so that he could demonstrate that love because without us, he didn't have a route to express that love the way that he wanted to. And so he created us to love us and to demonstrate how perfectly he could love. It's not that he couldn't love before he created us, but he wanted to demonstrate that love so desperately that he created us so that he could show that love. Verse 17 says, by this... Love is perfected in us. And then you you have to go back and look at at verse 16 because by what is love perfected in us? Well, by this, it says at the end, that's our theme verse. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, by God abiding in us, by us abiding in God, by us drawing near to him and being in a close relationship with him, that is the completion of love. That is the perfection of love that God had in mind when he created us. He made us to love us. We love because he first loved us. And that brings us full circle. What is the source of love? It is God. And he manifests that love in us. He teaches us how to love. He perfects his love through a relationship with us. And he does that so that we can go out and we can love. So that we can love one another, so that we can love him, so that we can love the kingdom, the church, so that we can love. God is love. He loves so much that he created us to have a loving relationship with us so that we can return that love to him. Now, with that in mind, that God is is love and he created us to love we need to get near him we need to to be as close to him as we can be we need to to be as fully enveloped and wrapped up in that love as we possibly can because that's why he created us that's why he that's what he wants from us and so how do we do that how do we get near to the heart of God? How do we get near to the one who created us so that we can experience the full measure of that love that we have seen described in 1 John? Well, there is one way to the Father. There is only one way to Him. John 14, verse 6, 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus there in John 14 is still in the upper room with his disciples after he has eaten the last supper with them on the night of his betrayal, and he is telling them that he is about to leave them for a time, but they know the way to get to him, and they don't understand because there's, there's still so much uh, confusion in their minds over exactly what Jesus is saying, but he is giving them clear directions, clear instructions. I'm going to be with my father. And I want you to be with my father as well. And the only way to be with the father is to get there through me. No one comes to the father but through Christ. There is no other means by which we can get there. In Acts chapter 4, by this time, which is only a matter of a few months after this night of confusion in John chapter 14, but by Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are, uh, have been arrested and, and they are preaching before the council and they say these words in verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We are not going to stop preaching the name of Jesus because it is in that name and in that name alone that we can draw near to the Father. And everyone needs to experience that. Everyone needs to know of the love that God has for them, the Father has for them, and of the way to get into that love, the way to draw near to that heart that has provided that love for us. There is one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ, His Son. And we need to understand that there is one way into Christ. See, there's really only two possibilities for those of us that are, that are of the age of accountability, for those of us that are amenable to the sins that we've committed in this life. There is really only two places that we can be. We can be outside of Christ or we can be in Christ. And we want to be in Christ because it is in Christ that we have the full revelation of God's love available to us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and we looked at that verse along the way, and we talked about what it meant for God to love the world, and this is God's love that is available to everyone. He has provided a means of salvation to every soul that has ever lived on this planet. Every person that has ever lived, that will ever live, has available to them the love of God that can save them from their sins. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God's love is on full display through the life of his son, Jesus. Second Peter three, verse nine, God is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God doesn't want to see anyone lost. And so he provides a way of salvation for all mankind through his son. God has made salvation available for all people through his son. We have to understand that. We have to realize that. We have to preach that. We have to teach that to those that are lost. Romans 8, verses 37 through 39, kind of help us see a distinction along the way. Paul writing there says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for every sin that has ever been committed. The blood of Jesus can forgive every sin that has ever been committed. But in order for that to take place, we have to come into contact with his son. We have to accept that love that has been offered and not reject Christ as our Savior. And Paul here says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So there is a measure of God's love that is available to those who are in Christ that is not available to those who are outside of Christ. That's a scary thought. We want to think of God's love being one dimensional, that it's a a one 
time deal. It's it's one love that is is just out there and everybody gets the same thing. And in a sense that is true because John 3:16 tells us that the world is is the uh, recipient of that love that that it's available to the world. But Romans chapter 8 Paul tells us that there is an aspect of God's love that is available only to those who are in Christ. And so the question becomes, how do I get in Christ? Because if I'm outside of Christ and I don't have a full measure of God's love, I don't have at my disposal, I don't have the ability to draw fully near to the heart of God because I have rejected His Son as my Savior, then how do I get from being outside of Christ to being inside of Christ? And of course the Scriptures tell us Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul writing there says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Baptism is an act of obedience done in faith. It is not an act done to earn salvation. Nowhere have I ever heard it spoken or ever heard it taught that baptism is to earn salvation. And certainly not from this pulpit have I ever heard that taught nor taught it myself. Baptism is not to earn salvation, but it is done to demonstrate our complete reliance upon God to provide for us what we could never provide for ourselves. I don't have the power to save myself. It is not through the name of Jesus or through the name of Jason that I can be saved. It is only through the name of Jesus. We need to edit that out of the video. It is only through the name of Jesus that salvation can come and never through the name of Jesus. <laughs> never through the name of Jason. I need to stop saying that. Baptism is an act of obedience done in faith. And it's through that act of faith that God takes me from being outside of Christ to being inside of Christ. Where the full measure of his love is demonstrated through the salvation of my soul from sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? The significance of baptism is in the reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We only get that by being immersed into the water, by being raised up out of the water, not by sprinkling or pouring. We only reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus when we are immersed into the water and raised up out of that water. We do that to die to the sin that separates us from God. Think about that for just a moment in the context of the lesson today. What is it that our goal is? To draw near to the heart of God, right? What does sin do? Sin separates. Sin drives us away from God. What did it do to Adam and Eve in the garden? It made them hide from God. What did it do to David in his sin with Bathsheba? It drove him away from God. Sin separates. But the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what can save me from my sin. And in baptism, we reenact that death, burial, and resurrection. It's in the moment of baptism that we come into contact with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, our sin is washed away and we are drawn near to God. We die to sin that separates us from God. We are raised in salvation to live a life that is near to Him. God's love is the most powerful force for change in this universe. It is able to change lives. It is able to change hearts. It is able to change our eternity. His love is all that matters. 
The passage that I chose this morning, I chose because of this verse near the end of that reading in John 14. Jesus there speaking to his disciples says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. Jesus had just got done telling them at the beginning of John chapter 14 that I'm going away. And you know where I'm going and you can follow me there. And then Thomas, bless his heart, said, I don't have any idea where you're going. Maybe it was Philip. Says, I don't know where you're going. I don't know how to get there. And Jesus is kind of stern with him in the verses that follow. But then he gets to this point and Jesus, it's almost like he's making a U-turn and says, you know what? If you love me the way that you're supposed to, and you follow me the way that I've asked you to follow me, me and my Father will come find you. We'll come be close to you where you're at. And we'll make sure that you make it the rest of the way. I don't know what the rest of this life holds for me or for you or for anyone else. But I know that I want to spend it living near to the heart of God. And He has made that available to all of us through His Son. We need to have our sins washed away so that the thing that separates us from God can be eliminated. And then we need to pursue a relationship with Him with everything that we have for the rest of our lives. The only thing that matters is being near to God. And we can only do that through Jesus. If you have any need this morning that you'd like to make public, we'd ask that you come and do so while we stand and sing.